In a previous video, we finished the propositions starting with two. And so in this video, we start with proposition three. The logical picture of the facts is the thought. Here we have our first indication that for Wittgenstein, a thinking and language are so closely connected as to be almost indistinguishable. We talked in our previous videos about Wittgenstein's picture theory of language or meaning, according to which you know, we, we say something about the world um, by making a picture of the world, by giving a, an image of the world. And for us to do that, what we needed was to have something like a, a scale model maybe, but it could also just be a sentence that on the one hand, had elements that corresponded to the elements of reality that we wanted to picture. So the sentence maybe contains words that correspond to things in reality, or the scale model contains objects that correspond to other objects in reality. So that's the first thing that we need. And then the second thing that we need is a certain variability, a certain freedom in putting these different elements together so that we can picture different possibilities in the world. The different ways in which we can set up the scale model corresponding with different situations in the real traffic. Or the different ways in which we can put words together into sentences corresponding with, again, different situations in the real world. So, when I think something, that thought is going to be a logical picture of the facts. So that thought too is going to have this sort of picturing relation to reality. It contains elements that correspond to things in the world and it has certain degrees of freedom that correspond to the possibilities of the world. Now, what Wittgenstein says is that the logical picture of the facts is the thought. And so that may prompt the question, well, what about an illogical picture of the facts, right? What about a picture that is not logical? Well, we've already seen that for Wittgenstein, a logical form is what something must have in order to picture reality at all, right? Logical form is what every picture has. Without a logical form, a picture couldn't be a picture of the facts or a picture of reality. And so the answer uh, to any question about, well, well, what about illogical pictures is that there are no illogical pictures, right? There's no such thing as an illogical picture. And if there's no such thing as an illogical picture, and if the logical picture of the facts is the thought, then of course there is also no such thing as an illogical thought. And that in fact is um, something that Wittgenstein is going to express in the three point zeros. So here is um, 3.001. A state of affairs is thinkable. What this means is the, that we can picture it to ourselves. So to be thinkable and to be picturable are the same thing. Or here, 3.02. A thought contains the possibility of the situation of which it is the thought. What is thinkable is possible too. So what is thinkable is possible too. What is thinkable is also possible. This, that the thinkable or conceivable is the same thing as the possible, is a much contested claim in philosophy. So there is some, it has some like immediate plausibility. Uh, here's a way to see an immediate plausibility. Suppose that somebody asks me to do this. Somebody says, well, I want you to picture the following thing. I want you to picture the situation in which it rains and doesn't rain, right? I want you to picture the situation in which it rains and doesn't rain. Now, of course, that is a logical contradiction, right? To claim that it rains and doesn't rain. It's something that, that can't happen. It's impossible. And when I try to picture this situation, I find myself in a bind, right? Should I sort of picture raindrops coming down? Well, yes and no. Well, it's hard to see how to proceed here. So these kinds of cases uh, suggest to us that, yeah, you know, the thinkable and the possible uh, seem to be the same thing. But there are other situations that might bring us to different ideas. So here is something that seems eminently thinkable. 
it seems very thinkable or conceivable that I flap my hands like this and then fly up into the air. Right? Why not? I can write a story about that and it would be completely intelligible. Uh, I could even claim that I can do this. Right? I could go to people and say, aha, I can fly into the air just by flapping my hands. So that seems thinkable. And yet, of course, people won't believe me and they won't believe me because it's impossible, right? No one can do that. You can't do that. It is not possible. So that seems to be a situation where possibility and thinkability are not the same thing. Here's another example, a famous example from philosophy. According to some philosophers, it is thinkable that there are people just like us, with bodies just like us and brains just like ours, with the same processes going on in those brains, and yet these people are not conscious. They are so-called philosophical zombies, right? They have the same bodies that we have, the same brains that we have, but they are not conscious. And these philosophers would say, well, that is thinkable. It's conceivable. We can, you know, it makes, it makes sense to describe this and therefore it is possible. And other philosophers say, no, no, the fact that it's thinkable does not mean that it's possible. And so, as I said, this is a, a at least a contested claim, right? The claim that the thinkable and the possible are the same thing. So why is Wittgenstein saying this here? Well, one way to understand why Wittgenstein is saying this here is that Wittgenstein turns out to have a very strict notion of possibility. According to Wittgenstein, all possibility is logical possibility. And so I take it that according to Wittgenstein, it is possible that I fly up into the air by flapping my hands, right? That doesn't, that, that is, we can picture it to ourselves, right? We can easily picture it to ourselves. And so it is possible. If I want to claim that it's impossible, I am making a mistake. The only possibility and necessity our logical possibility and necessity. But this is a theme that we are going to meet again only at the very end of the Tractatus, um, when Wittgenstein is going to, uh, among other things, criticize the idea of a sort of law of causation that tells us, you know, what is possible and what is not possible. Okay, so the kind of possibility that Wittgenstein seems to be thinking about here is logical possibility, and for Wittgenstein, that is the only kind of possibility. So if you got confused by 3.02, this is the background against which we have to understand it. Okay, then Wittgenstein goes on to explain, you know, that logic um, is sort of the bound of thinking, that there's no such thing as an illogical thought. So again, here is Wittgenstein. We cannot think, 3.03, .03, we cannot think anything unlogical for otherwise, we should have to think unlogically. It used to be said that God could create everything except what was contrary to the laws of logic. The truth is, we could not say of an unlogical world how it would look. To present in language anything which contradicts logic is as impossible as in geometry to present by its coordinates a figure which contradicts the laws of space or to give the coordinates of a point which does not exist. Right? There is no such thing, according to Wittgenstein, as an illogical thought. That is a thought which sort of is a thought and so pictures reality and at the same time doesn't fit in logical form, doesn't have the form demanded by logic. It rains and it doesn't rain is not an illogical thought because it's not a thought at all. Um, it's a sentence, but it also doesn't express a thought. There's no thought expressed by the sentence, it rains and it doesn't rain. We cannot think anything illogical because that would be to picture the unpicturable or to picture that which cannot be pictured. Or maybe because if I say it's to picture that which cannot be pictured, that seems to claim that there is something that cannot be pictured. Um, Maybe that's not the right way to say it, right? I mean, we're not claiming that there are these illogical things which unfortunately we cannot think. Um, it's more that, you know, an illogical thought is a picture that is not a picture and that just doesn't make any sense. 
All right, let's move on to 3.1. In the proposition, the thought is expressed perceptibly through the senses. Uh, in a proposition, a thought finds an expression that can be perceived by the senses. So here the German word for proposition is Satz. And Satz could also be translated as sentence. And possibly a translation uh, uh, by sentence makes it easier to understand that Wittgenstein is here talking about something that we can hear or see. Uh, this is in fact what Wittgenstein tells us in 3.11, uh, that we use the sensibly perceptible sign sound or written sign of the proposition as a projection of the possible state of affairs. So um, what we are, what Wittgenstein is going to think about now is language in the sense of signs, in the sense of something that you can speak or that you can write. And what he's going to want to understand is what that is, right? What is this kind of sign? When does a sign become a sign? When does it become a sentence? Those are some of the questions that Wittgenstein wants to ask, because obviously not just any, you know, random string of sounds uh, is a sign or a sentence, and not just any sort of string of, of marks on a paper is a sign or a sentence. And so we need to know something more. We need to hear what is needed for a string of sounds or a string of marks on paper to become something that you know, could be the sign of a sentence. Well, let's read 3.11 again. We use the perceptible sign of a proposition as a projection of a possible situation. Projection, that's something I want to zoom in on. But first I want to read on 3.12 and 3.13. The method of projection is to think of the sense of the proposition. I call the sign with which we express a thought a propositional sign. And a proposition is a propositional sign in its projective relation to the world. A proposition includes all that the projection includes, but not what is projected. Or as Ogden says, to the proposition belongs everything which belongs to the projection, but not what is projected. Therefore, the possibility of what is projected, but not this itself, not what is projected itself. In the proposition, therefore, its sense is not yet contained, but the possibility of expressing it. In the proposition, the form of its sense is contained, but not its content. Okay, projection. Uh, and then I'll zoom in on some of these, these phrases that I've just read out in order to find out what's going on here and in order to try to interpret what's going on here. Projection is basically the kind of relation that I have already been discussing several times, right? The kind of relation where we say, well, these elements of the sentence correspond with these elements of reality, and these different ways of putting the elements together in a sentence correspond to these different ways that the elements can be in reality, right? If I, if I make those links, well, that is the method of projection, right? That is how we get from the world to the sentence or from the sentence to the world. Okay, now let's read 3.13 again. To the proposition belongs everything which belongs to the projection, but not what is projected. Well, what does that mean? Not what is projected. Here's one way to understand. I'm going to, to talk about two, two ways to understand this. Here's a first way to understand that. The first way to understand it is this. It's to say, okay, for something to be a proposition, for something to be a sentence, is of course not just for it to be a bunch of sounds or a bunch of signs. It's something else. What we need is sounds or signs, yes, sure, of course, something like that. Um, but especially, we need two things more. We need, first of all, a grammar. And a grammar is a set of rules that indicates how this sentence, um, well, it indicates the rules according to which sentences can be constructed. Something, and this is a crucial insight of Wittgenstein's, something can be a sentence only if it is part of a much larger set of other sentences, all of which together are structured by grammatical rules. It is like the scale model. 
a particular position of the scale model can be a you know a an indication of a situation in reality a picture of a situation in reality only because it lives so to speak in a much larger space of other possible ways that the scale model could be put together right it's only because we can change the positions of these little cars and buildings and people and so on and so forth that any of the ways that we can put them together can be a picture of a particular reality and this is true with sentences in general right the cat is on the mat to take this um uh, standard example of a of a sentence often used in philosophy and linguistics the cat is on the mat is a sentence only because it lives in a realm of of sentence parts and grammatical rules that indicate that you know in this case for instance the cat can be taken out and replaced by other kinds of nouns right the dog is on the mat the baby is on the mat also that the mat can be taken out and replaced by other nouns the baby is on the cat the cat is on the baby the mat is on the dog um is on or maybe even is and on separately uh, have their own grammar and can be re replaced by certain other things uh, and so on and so forth right it is only because the sentence the cat is on the mat lives in this realm of variations that it can in fact picture a realm of possibilities or a particular possibility in reality namely a cat sitting on a mat which is one among many possibilities right something else being on the mat the cat being somewhere else and so on and so forth so that's one thing that we need we need a grammar which basically gives us a realm of variation which corresponds to the realm of possibilities that we are trying to uh, to picture and then the second thing that we need is this piece by piece relationship right where elements of the sentence correspond to particular things in the world that we want to picture right we have to make sure that the cat actually um, points to that cat out there in the world that this this phrase actually corresponds to a particular thing in the world so those are the two things and one way to read now the claim that to the proposition belongs everything which belongs to the projection but not what is projected is this it is to say well the projection is all the stuff i've just been talking about it's the grammar and the relations of elements of the language to things in the world and what doesn't belong to the proposition is what is projected and those are just the things in the world right the cat doesn't belong to the proposition the mat doesn't belong to the proposition and so on and so forth so that's one way to read this but it's maybe not the best way to read it and to see that let's look again at the last sentence of 3.13 in the proposition the form of its sense is contained but not its content well it certainly seems that if i have the cat is on the mat and i have its grammar and I have the relation of all the elements of the sentence two things in the world to the cat and the mat and so on then I have not only its form but also its content right there doesn't seem to be anything formal about this grasp of the sentence um, I grasp the full content and so maybe Wittgenstein is saying something else and I think that indeed Wittgenstein is saying something else uh, my preferred interpretation of what Wittgenstein is doing here is to say that what belongs to the projection is and so what belongs to the proposition as such right what makes it a proposition at all is just the grammar and not the relations to particular things in the world so in order to recognize something as a proposition at all we need to see it as something that belongs to this realm of grammatical possibilities and then we can see that this realm of grammatical possibilities has the right structure to picture this realm of possibilities in the world. And that is why we can say that in the proposition, its sense is not yet contained, but the possibility of expressing it. So this grammar, because it fits this realm of possibility in the world, can express this realm of possibility in the world. 
it shows the possibility of expressing it, but it doesn't yet contain its sense. And so something is a proposition if it has this grammatical structure of which it is a part. Um, but of course, it only becomes really meaningful if we do something in addition, which is linking the elements of the sentence to things in the world. Okay, so that's, I think, the best way to understand why Wittgenstein is saying what he does here. It is maybe not the most important thing, because most of the time, in fact, almost all of the time, when we are interested in certain sentences or propositions, we are going to be interested in senses or propositions where the identification or, or the link with specific things in the world has already been made. So usually we have, of course, both a grammar and a link to certain things in the world. But, okay, maybe there are certain cases where it makes sense to separate the two. And uh, in fact, there are maybe a few points later on in the Tractatus where it's going to be helpful to understand that there are these two things that maybe Wittgenstein talks about sentences and propositions already, if we just have the grammatical structure, and maybe in a sense still have to make the connection to particular elements of the world. Let's move on to 3.14. What constitutes a propositional sign is that in it, its elements, the words, stand in a determinate relation to one another. A propositional sign is a fact. A proposition is not a blend or a mixture of words. A propositional sign is a fact. What does that mean? Well, what Wittgenstein is pointing out is that only a fact can picture a fact. It is the fact that the cat is on the mat the fact that these elements are put together in this way, right? The fact that these elements are put together in this way pictures that the cat is on the mat. It is the fact that the elements are put together in a certain way that pictures that the corresponding things in reality are put together in a certain way. It's only because a sentence is a fact, because it's not just a bunch of th things thrown together, but it's a bunch of things put together in a particular, in an articulate way, that makes it able to picture a, um, um, a fact in reality. So the propositional sign is a fact. In fact, Wittgenstein tells us a little later on in what I think is a, a pretty wonderful note, 3.1431, that we may be, it may be easier for us to understand this fact nature of sentences if we don't think of it in terms of words, uh, but if we think of it in terms of objects. So there he tells us that the essence of a propositional sign is very clearly seen if we imagine one composed of spatial objects, such as tables, chairs and books, instead of written signs. Then the spatial arrangement of these things will express the sense of the proposition. So, for instance, there is absolutely nothing that can stop me from saying that this thing, this pen, corresponds to the cat. And this thing, my telephone, corresponds to the mat. And that the spatial relation of the pen to the telephone corresponds to the basically same spatial relation of the cat to the mat. And then what I have here is the propositional sign that expresses the thought that the cat is on the mat, right? This, this situation, this state of affairs, this fact, this fact that the pen is on the telephone expresses that the cat is on the mat. And this, this fact that the telephone is on the pen expresses the fact that the mat is on the cat and so on and so forth. So that's a way to think about that. Uh, it's a way to see that, that propositions themselves are facts, are already structured, right? They are put together in a specific way and they could have been put together in another way. And these other ways correspond to different ways that the world could have been. And therefore Wittgenstein can say in 3.1432, and this may be confusing at first, but it's 
basically a way of, of repeating what I just said, that we should not say the complex sign ARB says A stands in relation R to B, right? As if the sign says something where the fact nature of that sign is completely obscured, right? We cannot read from this, the complex sign blah, blah, says blah, blah. We can't see that the sign is a, is a, is a fact. Instead, we should emphasize this fact nature and say, well, that A, the sign A, right? That the sign A stands in a certain relation to the sign B, says that ARB, that the sign the cat stands to a certain relation to the sign the mat, says that the cat is on the mat, that the sign my pen stands in a certain relation to the sign my telephone, says that the cat is on the map. That's basically what Wittgenstein is abstractly saying in 3.1432. Okay. Let's check out the 3.2s for a while. In propositions, thought can be so expressed that to the objects of the thoughts correspond the elements of the propositional sign. Or in a proposition, a thought can be expressed in such a way that the that elements of the propositional sign correspond to the objects of the thought. Well, basically the same thing. The objects of the thought are the things that the things in the world that my thought is about. Right? The things in the world that my thought is about. In a proposition, thoughts can be so expressed that to the objects of the thoughts correspond the elements of the propositional sign. So my sign has elements, it has parts, and those parts correspond to the things in the world that I'm thinking about. Yeah, okay, that's exactly what we've already been talking about several times, right? When I say the cat is on the mat, or when I think the cat is on the mat, um, you know, I'm thinking about the cat and I'm thinking about the mat. And in my sentence, there are elements, the cat and the mat, that correspond to these things that I'm thinking about. So much is clear. The one thing that might give us pause here in 3.2 is Wittgenstein's use of the word can. In propositions, thoughts can be so expressed. Why can? Doesn't it always have to be this way? No, Wittgenstein would say. Usually, in fact, maybe even always in our normal uses of language, there are no elements of the propositional sign that really express the objects of the thought. And that is because the real objects of the thought, the things that my thought fundamentally is about, are the simple objects, the simple things that form the substance of the world that we learned to... Um, think about in the propositions too. The cat and the mat are certainly not among the simple things in the world. And so the signs, the, or the parts of my sign, the cat and the mat, certainly do not correspond to simple things in the world. But, Wittgenstein says, at least in principle, it ought to be possible to analyze any sentence to the point where we are talking about the simple things in the world, and then in our sentences, those simple things would have to be expressed, right? There would have to be signs, parts of the sentence corresponding to the simple things that I'm talking about. And that is why Wittgenstein can say in 3.201, these elements I call simple signs and the proposition completely analyzed. So Wittgenstein is here thinking through something that has to be possible according to him. It has to be possible to take any sentence, including something like the cat is on the mat, to analyze it completely until it talks only about simple things. And then that analyzed sentence is going to have parts that correspond or stand for those simple things. And those parts are simple signs. And what is the nature of those simple signs? Well, 3.202 tells us the simple signs employed in propositions are called names, right? Because what do they do? Well, the only thing that those simple signs do is they correspond to a particular thing, a particular object. And of course, that is precisely what a name does. A name corresponds to a particular object. 
in naming an object, we give it a sign that corresponds to it. So, according to Wittgenstein, any meaningful sentence can be analyzed until you get to the simple signs, which are the names of the simple objects that form the substance of the world. Here's something that Wittgenstein says, 3.221. Objects I can only name. Signs represent them. I can only speak of them. I cannot assert them. A proposition can only say how a thing is, not what it is. Propositions can only say how things are, not what they are. Well, why does he say that? Here's a pen, right? And it seems that I can certainly say what it is. It's a pen. Aha, Wittgenstein would say. Well, that is already enough to prove that what you are holding is not a simple object, right? Because what are you saying when you're saying that this is a pen? Well, you're saying, you're describing it by explaining what kind of complex it is, right? A pen is something that is built up out of certain constituents in a certain way. And so to say that something is a pen is to describe it as a complex of a certain kind. And of course, a complex is something that is built up of objects that are simpler than it is itself. Furthermore, a complex is always contingent. It is always something that also could have not existed, right? It is possible for the constituents of my pen to form a different complex or maybe to form no complex at all and be scattered through the world, and then this pen will no longer exist, right? So yes, of course, you can say what something is if that thing is a complex, but you can't say what something is if that thing is a simple object. Simple objects you can only name. That is the meaning of 3.221. And then we come to an incredibly important claim, 3.23 which sort of condenses an entire argument that we can sort of stitch together out of different parts of the Tractatus. But here it is condensed into one little sentence with, with almost no explanation, but we need to understand it in order to understand what Wittgenstein is doing here. The requirement that simple signs be possible is the requirement that sense be determinate. The requirement that simple signs be possible is the requirement that sense be determinate. Wittgenstein is obviously thinking about a, an objection here, right? He has said that every sentence can be analyzed until you get to simple signs that name simple objects. Why would we believe him? Why would we believe him, right? I mean, he can't give us the analysis. He can't give us even any examples. Why would we believe this? Here is Wittgenstein's argument extremely compressed. Well, he says, why do I require that simple signs be possible? Why do I claim that it must be possible to analyze all sentences into simple signs? Because only if you require that is sense determinate. Okay, what does he mean? Well, he means this. Any sentence, any meaningful sentence, which is any sentence, um, pictures a possibility, right? It's a picture of a possible state of affairs. Okay, it's a picture of a possible state of affairs. But whether a state of affairs is possible cannot depend on what is actually the case, right? Whether something is possible doesn't depend on what is actually true. And so whether a sentence is meaningful whether it really pictures a possibility cannot depend on whether anything else is true, right? Whether something is meaningful can't depend on what is true. But names are only meaningful, or maybe I should say sentences which contains names are only meaningful if those names actually correspond to something. Like the claim that Shak Kaboobel lives in Amsterdam well, if Shaq Kaboobel is not the name of anything, 
and I'm assuming that it's not the name of anything, then this sentence is not a picture of reality. It, 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 I do not paint any picture of reality by telling you that Shaq Kabubel, which is a name with no referent, lives in Amsterdam. So in order for a sentence to be meaningful, a sentence with names, those names actually have to refer to something. And so if whether a sentence is meaningful cannot depend on any truths, well, then it had better be the case that whether a name refers to something cannot depend on any truths. But names of complexes only refer to something if certain other things are true. Suppose that I take this pen and I name this pen and I name this pen Richard. Hi, Richard. Any sentence about Richard is meaningful only if Richard exists. That's how names work. But Richard only exists if it's true that certain constituents of Richard form a particular kind of complex, right? It could easily have been the case that Richard did not exist. And so whether any sentences about Richard are meaningful depends on whether certain things are true. And that's not allowed when we are talking about sort of the real names. And so the real names that we need in order for our language to sort of really be about the world, to really connect to the world, must be a different kind of name. It must be a kind of name that is not the name of a complex, which might also not exist. These must be the names of the elementary things, the simple things, which exist no matter what, right? Which form the substance of the world. And so here in 3.23, we have extremely compressed this argument that it must be possible to analyze sentences into the names of simple things because we need names for language to connect to the world. We need meaning to be independent of truth. And we can only have names that are meaningful independent of truth if they are the names of simple things. And so the very nature of language and the nature of the language world relationship requires it to be possible that language is analyzed into simple signs that are the names of simple things that form the substance of the world. Okay, 3.24 is actually a bit of explanation of that, even though it might not be obvious if you don't already have the argument sort of before you, uh, because that's where, where Wittgenstein tells us something about complexes. Right? A complex can be given only by its description, which will be right or wrong. I can describe the pen, but I can't name it. That wouldn't really be a name. A proposition that mentions a complex will not be nonsensical if the complex doesn't exist, but simply falls. If I talk about this complex, if I talk about this pen and it doesn't exist, I will simply have said something false. If I say my pen is black, um, and in the meantime somebody has destroyed my pen, that will be simply false. Because what I'm really saying is, these and these and these simple things are in this and this complex, and the complex is black but they're not in that complex. And what I say is not nonsensical, but simply false. Okay, so Wittgenstein makes a few further claims. He tells us that a proposition has one and only one uh, complete analysis. He tells us that names cannot be analyzed further, that they are primitive signs. Um, and I think we can sort of see how all of that fits into the story that I've been telling you. So, so much for the 3.2s. Uh, in the next video, I will go on at 3.3 and look at the rest of the threes with you.